Sweet. Welcome to the second annual. Super bad. So this year we decided that maybe we could help assist in making it a little more fun for the audience. Uh, and so if you can just stay calm and follow directions for one second, because I kind of panic when something's in front of me and I don't know what it looks like. So the first part of this that says question one, two, three, and four is what you need to pay most attention to. The other part over here that has the team name and the total scores will be for later. So all you're going to do. The first question is going to be red, right? And the teams are going to get up and you're going to know who they are. And the team that you think gave the most ethical, awesome answer is going to go in spot number six. And that's going to equate to points then. 
So you're saying the best team had six points, and you're going to write their name right here. One. It doesn't mean that you're awful, it just means you weren't the best. So you do that for each question, and then each of those numbers equates for a point, or six points for that matter. So then all we're going to ask you to do is total that for the teams on the other side of the sheet that you see. So it has the team names, AH, CBSSM, DRC, and each question, whatever their points were, you'll add those up, and then you'll give them to the us. Does that make enough sense? Let me just be ethical for a moment. You might be here supporting a team. I think that's really great. But I think maybe you shouldn't put them down for number six every time. Maybe we should listen to answers and be ethical. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> oh, lowest points. Lowest points wins. That was Joan's fault. Joan's fault right there. Point at her. Sorry, she told me that. Uh, so, my fault. I thought originally when we had the conversation that we were going six best. So, do we? can we all agree? Can we all agree that number one is the best? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. I don't know what else there is. Okay. So, we will go with one is best. Six is not the best, and then we'll total those points. Lowest team wins. Basically, you get to take your team to Cafe Marie in Ann Arbor. Uh, the owner, Jeannie Loveland, was kind enough to donate that tonight, and so that will be the winner for the team. Thank you. Making ideas work, and also Steve Maggio of the Maggio line, who is our photographer. Um, Linda Fitzgerald of Fitzgerald Communications, and Sharon Blushen as well. We're all helping us out this evening. Um, make sure you take care of your servers tonight. Our servers are Colleen, Brandon, and Dan. If you have ever been to Connor O'Neill's, you know that the service here is pretty excellent, along with the food and the fish and chips. So take care of your servers. They're here to help with anything you need. And also we want to thank Connor Meals and Carolyn, who gave us this room for free in the middle of the restaurant. So, All right, so let's talk about our fabulous judges right up here. So author, journalist, and frequent contributor to the New York Times Cultural Selections, we have Jennifer Conlon in the middle. Thank you. Community College philosophy and ethics teacher, former Ann Arbor Public School teacher at Community High School, Brian Miller. <laughs> and also St. Joseph Mercy Health System Institutional Review Board and Research Compliance Administrator. Does that fit on your business card? <laughs> Darlene Walberg. <laughs> All right, and very quickly, I'm going to introduce our teams. These six tables up here in the front, these are our six teams. So the first one, team one over here, all ethics are local, think local first team. If you guys want to stand up and do a little fanfare for yourself. <laughs> locally owned independent businesses in our county by providing resource sharing as well as expertise in developing strategies for business, businesses who are committed, committed to making where we live both healthier and vibrant for all. This is their first slam, so we wish you guys luck. Oh, the second team we have, we have Arbor Hospice Ethics. This is their second slam. You guys want to stand up and show yourselves? volunteers that provide support and dignity to patients with life limiting illness and comfort to their families prior to death and during bereavement for almost three decades. And our next team is Life, Death, and Pickles. You guys want to stand up? This team routinely confronts life and death situations in their work the LDP team, 
includes several members of the emergency medical department as well as the school of LS and A, all of them affiliated faculty members of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine and Michigan, a research, policy, and education think tank and action tank within the University Medical School. All right. And then we have the DRCs, or the Dispute Resolution Center. And we have second place tie last year, which Green Hill School won. And this year the team is coming back to go beyond their refrigerator magnet tie. <laughs> so Green Hill School, please stand up. non-denominational college preparatory school in Ann Arbor, educating 540 students in the 6th and 12th grades. The sixth team is none other than the next generation philanthropists, and they have spiffy t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> their muscles this year returning once again. The NGP group is a group of young professionals who pool their resources annually to award grants to local community programs. Over the last four years, they have awarded more than $30,000 to a wide range of nonprofits. And now our fearless timekeeper, Martha, is going to explain the rules. The rules of the game. First, there are seven rules to this game. The first is the rule of order. The team order has already been determined. There will be enough time for four rounds of questions, and the object of the competition is to score the highest number of points in responding to the questions across all rounds. Two, the rule of democracy. Each question has been submitted by the public through the A2 Ethics website. The rule of the hat. Questions will be selected from the hat. So you won't be bored. Each team will receive a different question in each round. The rule of two. Each team gets two minutes to confer and plan their answer and two minutes for their spokesperson to make their response. Now, I am also the timekeeper, so when I stand up from my seat here, I'll start when, the, when you start talking, and when I stand up, that means that you're finished, okay? If you don't finish when I stand up, you will hear that loud, screeching whistle, okay? Number five is the rule of law. The judges will take 30 seconds to score and make comment on the responses for one minute. So that could also be called the rule of a minute and a half. <laughs> the perfect score for each question is 25 points based on five criteria from substance to originality. Judges' scores, however, will not be announced until the end of the slam. Number six, the rule of the crowd. And you've already heard the whole explanation about how the crowd will be able to vote and help to propel their team to victory. Number seven is the rule of ethics. At the end of all rounds, the scores for each team's responses will be totaled and the grand prize winner will be announced. The grand prize winner receives $600 and the philosopher's hat for a year. The second place team, those infamous refrigerator maids. That's it. Thank you and have fun. Martha and really, based on last year, you don't mess with the timekeeper. Just so you know. So, shall we start our competition? John, bring on the philosopher's hat. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Slight amendment to the rules. It was just pointed out by one of the judges that I should stand up when you have 10 seconds, not when you're absolutely drop dead finished, okay? So I will stand up, if I can do the math, I'll try my best to do it at about 10 seconds, okay? 
Now we're going to attack. All right, who's our first team? You have an eight, right? Think local. Think local first. Think local first. Your question is, can you give some examples of someone who has acted with dignity? because when he um, started out, he uh, believed it um, first. He, uh, what, he ended up being president of South Africa. And um, when um, he started out, he believed in segregation. And he uh, um, changed his mind. And um, basically what he ended up doing was um, he dismantled the evil that uh, South Africa was uh, uh, doing at that time with um, segregation between black and white communities. And uh, he pointed out the shortfalls of that system. And um, he eventually freed Nelson Mandela, who we're all familiar with. And eventually what he did was he uh, worked hard to change the constitution in South Africa so that one voice equal one vote. And the other, I just want to also add that we struggled with dignity versus courage, because there's a very big difference between courage and uh, dignity. Courage would be like the Tiananmen Square guy who came out the tank man. And we thought that Willem F. de Klerk, uh, I'm sorry, F. William de Klerk, uh, met the criteria for dignity. And our next question is for our next team. Who's our next team? The next generation philanthropist. Your question is, if I don't eat fast food, is it morally all right to give the homeless man I pass every day food that I would never eat? <laughs> They choose to eat it after you give it to them, and you're providing nourishment and well-being. It's definitely helpful. So if you have someone that's starving, they need food. And just like someone may be a vegetarian and not eat meat, but that doesn't mean that others do. And obviously, the food is meets health standards, and you know there's available plenty of people out there eat it. So it's got to be okay. And, <laughs> I mean, people aren't dying from eating it. So if it's a matter of life and death, it really, I, I would think that picking the option of life is better than death to help out somebody. So. So, a quick reminder on the scoring. When it comes to audience participation, the lowest score is what you were shooting for. And on the judges, we're looking for the highest score. We try to make this as confusing as possible. But, yeah, we're, but we're here to help, so just let us know. Judges, are we ready? Okay. 
All right, um, I'm going to comment very briefly on Think Local First. Uh, their question was uh, to uh, talk about someone who has acted with dignity. They made an interesting distinction between dignity and courage. However, I would have liked to see them develop that definition further. Uh, just because something is not something else doesn't necessarily tell us what that thing is. So it, it, in any group, when you're talking about these kinds of terms, whether it be honorable, whether it be you know, right, wrong, uh, ethical, uh, anything like this, and here's the word dignity that needs clarification, I think that would help. Uh, we like the fact that you gave many examples of how this person acted in a dignified way. Um, but again, just make sure you, you define those terms so we know what the exact difference is between dignity, for example, and uh, courage, okay? Commenting on um, Next Generation Philanthropists, I, I liked very much um, your being incredibly objective, understanding, um, you know, vegetarians have to make that choice themselves. You're not actually putting the food into their mouth. You're giving it to them. They're hungry. and and it meets health standards. And so there, are, there, were, there were some very good life or death, clear arguments made there. So um, I, think, I think well done on that, very objective, well done. All right, so our next team is team number three. Who's going next, guys? Yeah, so. Dispute Resolution Center, cool. So your question is, how should the public be informed and consulted in preparing for the ethical issues of a pandemic? What are the main ethical issues? from everyone not to control um, chaos and panic in the streets, but I guess I would argue that we would need a sense of transparency. Transparency of information so that people are as informed as absolutely possible, so they have uh, con contingency plans, they would understand the limitations of available drugs, they'd be able to, in fact, isolate um, infected populations, understand the um, under, understand the fact that some drugs would in fact uh, be limited and different in different parts of the community uh, might not be able to get them. At the same time, it's really important that uh, transparency builds confidence and builds trust. Um, we need to know, we really need to know that there are a clear set of con contingency plans and that our leaders are doing what's in the best interest of all of us that is fair and that most of us will be impacted in a positive way. And in the same regard, we all need to go home tonight and watch Contagion, Outbreak, or the Drama I thought it was like right again in that um, the transparency and full disclosure is very important um, and that the confidence that that brings to a community or to an environment is, is paramount. I guess I would have liked to have seen um, more on a comment on what is fair. You know, when you talked about what is, you know, everything should be done, you know, as per fair. And I'm like, well, okay, a little bit more information on what, what would be fair. Of what is there in a situation like that? 
Well, just looking at, yeah, do you allow our old people maybe taken out of that equation at some point if, if you're sick or our younger people given priority? I think it's, it's good to address some of the ethical specifics that are really difficult in these situations. <laughs> Thank you, judges. And our next question. Next team, raise your hand, please. And we have Arbor Hospice. I am desperate to find a job. Every prospective employer tells me I am overqualified. Should I fail to include my doctorate in my applications, given that applications include a sentence requiring me to attest to the truthfulness of the information I have supplied? Be honest about who you are. Now you can be creative in how you do your resume. I mean, your PhD can be very small, like maybe six point. <laughs> and your uh, enjoyment, your hobbies can be a larger font. For instance, let me give you an example. Let's say I have a PhD in social work, which I didn't achieve, but would be nice to have. But I have spent the many years that I have spent working in. Uh, a career related to social work, part of those holding administrative positions. I came to a point in my life, which I have come to, where I have realized that frontline work gives more meaning to what I do at this point in my life than what my PhD position could garner in the public workplace. I would then say in my interview, you may notice I have a PhD. However, at this point in my time, I have done a lot of soul searching about what my gifts and talents are, and I would like to apply for your position here at camp, working with young kids who are going through life transitions, who are struggling with who they are, because I feel I can bring the practical experience at your $9.50 an hour wage <laughs> than at that other wage that those of you who may have PhDs know goes beyond that hourly rate. So I really feel it's important to be transparent and be honest about why you are seeking this position, what meaning you have in your years of experience that you are bringing to what somebody thinks is a position for which you're overqualified. Speak from your heart. Be sincere, be honest, be truth-telling, and perhaps you'll get that job. Um, I, like, I very much like that response in this probably very over-educated town that we're in. And, um, I, my first job interview, I went in with another person and the editor said, um, why should I hire you? You have a master's, you'll want to be paid more. And I was 21 and I said, no I won't. And he said, you'll, you're hired. <laughs> so he completely tricked me, but your answer was fabulous because it's telling the truth, but also addressing, I think, immediately um, you're willing to work for less. You see the, the um, value in in, in a job at this point that would introduce you to other skills. So I think you really um, did look at those ethical questions involved in telling the truth, but also addressing what the issue would be of not getting the job if you're overqualified and, and trying to get around that. Just um, I thought it was articulated very well. Uh, delivery was great. Uh, the humor was interesting. Um, I would be careful, though, that you don't stress the humor too much because I think when you said that no you definitely should not lie I think that carries the weight of, of your argument when you're that emphatic about it and then when you mentioned well just put it in smaller font you know while it was funny I don't think it would look good in print because we wouldn't catch the humor necessarily we might take it seriously so just be careful when using humor in these ethical discussions. All right, thank you, judges. And we're on team five. Who's team five? Green nose. And green nose, your question is, 
Should we be prevented from having more than one identity other than our legal identity when we go online? Couldn't go online. First of all, uh, let me say how pleased my colleagues and I are to be here, this room full of people who are interested in talking about ethics. Um, it's really nice to know that we're willing to light a candle rather than curse the darkness here, although I will confess I was cursing the darkness on the way over thinking about the political discourse that's been going on uh, recently. Now, the question that we have is very interesting because we live in an age that's constantly in transition now between uh, our um, real life, RL, and virtual life, VL. And we're constantly being asked to rethink what the relationship between these two things are. However, we're not being asked to think about what the relationship is to truth and how truth is an important constant in our uh, equation, which is uh, the social contract that allows us to interact with one another on uh, personal levels, romantic levels, financial levels, legal levels, all of these different relationships that we depend on when we talk about building a community. If in fact we draw a distinction between something like say an identity or something like a persona, uh, then we can admit that we, we do have various persona, which is uh, I'm representing Green Hills, I should behave professionally though a couple of more smithics and I might start singing Irish songs. I hope that's not going to happen for your sake. Um, but it would not reflect well on, on the institution that's trusted me. However, that would just be a persona. But if I can create a completely different identity, then I can run away from all sorts of responsibilities that help to strengthen the community. My family, my job responsibilities, my responsibilities to um, people on the street. So we want to be clear about the differences between the two. Thanks. And before we go to commentary from our judges, just a quick little commercial here. We have some fabulous literature from our various teams. So if you would like to pick this up at any point in time, on your way to the bathroom, on your way home, whenever, come stop up here and you can grab this and find out more information about our teams here this evening. So commentary from our judges. I'm going to give them one more moment. And Martha's tiny. Okay. Um, this this uh, this topic we, we certainly talked about it quite a bit at the judging team, and uh, I think the strongest part of the argument had to do with uh, the emphasis on truth and its importance in such a contract. Uh, without it, the contract is null and void. It seems to me, and also the issue of responsibility. So I think those are the two most important uh, concepts that were brought out in that argument. I think the argument kind of varied a little bit off the topic somewhat in times. Um, I would have liked to have seen maybe more of a focus and maybe specifics. Uh, where do we see this uh, on the internet, whether it's Facebook, uh, uh, dating services or whatever it may be, or posting things, uh, blogs without your name on it and such. Um, so I would have liked to see maybe a little bit more detail on how we see this on the internet. Uh, I, I agree on that, um, though I have to be ethical and say I went to Green Hill, so. <laughs> um, I think that, that it was great, the, the community um, and the fact that he brought up legal, financial, romantic, all the places this, this tends to come through. But yeah, maybe more specifics on the actual internet. Thank you, judges. And uh, team number six, and this is the last team for this round, is Life, Death, and Pickles. Thank you for writing a big number six on your team sign. And your question is, 
what is the ethical impact of corporations being regarded as people? <laughs> Spotlight. Um, I think from our team's perspective, we found this uh, a challenging question given some of the recent uh, pieces of information and points of view that are uh, in the public eye uh, with Congress evaluating whether or not uh, a corporation should be regarded as people or as a person. There are a variety of points of view in the respect of if one does consider a corporation as a person, does that then give people an opportunity to take some kind of action against them? Uh, if there were a legal action uh, to be able to take on the corporation versus the individuals within the corporation. However, uh, I think there's a stronger point for looking at corporations not being uh, identified as people. They are not living or breathing entities uh, and the, the potential for looking at corporations in that way could put an unhealthy burden on society. Uh, thank you. Thank you. versus people, and I guess I would have, you said it would be an unhealthy burden to society, and I guess if we just expanded on that a little bit, you know, some examples of, of what that would entail might have just uh, helped us along uh, thinking down that path. No, just looking at when you look at the super PACs now and how that's affecting campaigns and how the corporations are not, if corporations are people, then you need to look at, you know, should they be taxed the way people are taxed? And there are some pretty big issues out there right now that are, you know, in the news every day. So maybe a bit more on that would have been helpful. Okay, thank you, judges. And congratulations, teams. You made it to round one. So now we're going to move right on to round two. And so our first team, all ethics are local and local first. And your question? Sorry, I just said to turn it into work first. Okay, so think local first. Your question is Bless you. Is there an ethical difference between being immoral and amoral? talk to someone who can't speak your language or someone who won't speak it. And I think it's meaningful because the distinction is significant. Uh, immoral is a pretty subjective uh, uh, judgment, immoral versus moral. But amoral is an objective judgment. If a person is immoral, you have to make that judgment based on a perception of what morals there are. But if a person is amoral, that simply means without. It means that they're sort of outside of that whole spectrum of consideration. Uh, so I think it's it's a 
a significant difference. And as far as the application to ethics, well, I think for most people, ethics are sort of behaviors guided by the morals that, that we hold. So if a person has no morals per se, then we have to look at them and say, is this person's behavior guided by uh, any particular principle or philosophy, or is it just essentially whatever they feel like at the particular moment? So I think that really is fundamentally what the ethical difference is between immoral and amoral. Give the judges a minute to deliberate and check their scores. Okay. Um, so um, first of all, it, this question is interesting because it's really a question of fact. There is a distinction between amoral and immoral, and I think you did a good job in defining how they're different. I, I kind of liked your creativity in having the analogy early on about the language. Some speak and some don't, and, and so there's that kind of difference as well. Probably the, the, what would really rock solid solidify your argument is if you maybe talked about people, how they behave if they're amoral, excuse me. Uh, you, you made the definitions clear, and maybe, you know, what does that look like in the real world when someone is amoral? Um, they may do good, they may do wrong, but what is the nature of their thinking? How do they perceive themselves vis-a-vis -vis society? That would, that would have been very helpful too. But very good argument. Yeah, okay, and T2, which is the next generation philanthropist. Important. Your question Important. is? <laughs> Does buying green make me a better person? <laughs> you have two minutes. So our decision is that buying green is a good thing but it does not necessarily define that you're a good person. Um, just as not buying green doesn't make you a bad person. Different people have different means, different things available to them, and not everyone can buy green things, and it depends on everyone's circumstances, and if nothing else is considered in terms of what else is available to you, Sure, choose, if you can choose green, that's good, but you have to consider when things are not always available and you can't always buy green. So the definition of being a good person just because of that is not necessarily the case. So buying green is good, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good person. Thank you, next Okay, next generation. I like the fact that you brought up that this is a um, class issue on many levels because it is more expensive also to buy green. But there's also, um, there are ethical issues around green products, which I think are interesting too. There are a lot of products that pretend to be green that aren't. And you actually, if you even have the means to consume green, need to look closely at labeling and where things are coming from because it has become a promotional branding, marketing way of doing things as well. So there is another ethical issue with green and buying green isn't always actually ethical. But um, beyond that, yes, very well, well spoken. Thank you. And T3, the DRC student. Thank you. Suppose you are working for a public relations firm that has been hired to deal with a former coach charged with sexual abuse of children. What are some of the ethical issues that you face? Yeah. 
see you on camera in the spotlight. Thank you. So, what are the ethical issues that I face? Can I be objective with the client? Can I separate the act from the person? Can I determine a rational or cause and make the public aware of extenuating circumstances? Should I recuse myself from the case or quit if I can't address the above? So for this, so that for this question, I think what really we settled on is can can I really put my own beliefs and thoughts aside and do my job effectively? And what doing my job effectively may mean is can I do what I'm paid for? Can I represent my client's best interests? And sometimes that best interest is for me to be transparent about my ability not to be able to represent them and to perhaps reveal what's going on. Um, I think one of the, uh, an ethical dilemma that any employee has is about doing the best job that they can in their position. And then the last thing with this is, um, should I get a job at Penn State? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, DRC. <laughs> Uh, we we are completely in agreement with you. We were discussing this before, and um, basically, if you're a public relations firm, you are not legally representing. You are not like a public defender who has to take on this uh, job. In fact, you could hurt your other clients in the firm by taking on a client that really you didn't believe in and hurt your business overall. And this is, you know, this is certainly a, a situation of you can recuse yourself from this. And so, we think that's a good an good answer. Um, I, th I think it was really well done how you constructed the rhetorical mode by asking all these questions because this is what people do when they're in an ethical situation, you know. If I do this, this might happen, what about this and that. And I like the fact that you brought up the notion of your duty as an employee. I mean, that, you signed on to be a PR person, you must have known ahead of time that you may have clients that aren't the most uh, desirable to have. What I would have liked to have seen, however, was an emphatic what you would do. Um, what if this was the case? You, you, you sort of went back and forth on it by saying, well, I probably would you know, maybe try to do my job. That's what I'm hired to do. But I didn't hear anything emphatic out of that argument. Okay, then our next team, Arbor Hospice. Describe the ethics of a military that is planning to use robots rather than humans in battle. All right, this is a tough question because it really brings into the thought of ethics of war, and I'm not here to debate that. But the use of robots, right now the U.S. Army is predicting that they would like to have a goal of 30% of their troops be robotic. And there are a lot of issues related to this. Are we just sending robots to do our job? Certainly the Army that has the robots can be the aggressor and not have the damage and the loss of life that um, the other side would have. But behind the robots, there have to be human beings making the decision. And the important ethical part of this is that the paradigms for the decision making have to be well thought out. It's not just sending a drone to bomb innocent uh, individuals. But if we are going to go to war, if there is an aggression, the robots have to have humans behind them. And the decision making has to be well thought out so that there is the transparency of what they're doing that we're not just out to take over the world because we have the better toys and we have the bigger equipment to do so. All right, thank you very much. We have come to We're going to give them a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I agree. I think that's a good point. There, the software development, there has to be a human behind that decision making capability, right? So. You're still accountable for your actions, whether um, it's robotic or a person. So 
I guess maybe we could explore the, I don't know, ethical ramifications of, of the robot. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, you mentioned drones and robots, and <clears throat> they're clearly different, but you, you sort of use them in the same vein. So, uh, you know, clearly one has an operator that makes all the decisions right there uh, in real time, whereas if you had a robot, it would certainly be programmed to sense aggression or however it, it's done, so it would be a little bit more uh, generalized, if you will, in terms of what it can do, or it's, it's not necessarily an operator-specific sort of thing, so it goes back. And then would you hold the programmers ethically responsible for the deaths? Um, so, but, but I thought that uh, your delivery was great. You just articulated each point. I like the use of the fact. Um, I'll have to do a fact check on that, so <laughs> I'm not sure that that's necessarily true, but it's interesting nonetheless, and it's always good to throw out some of that stuff, but overall, pretty good job. All right, so we're going to go to T5, Green Hills. <laughs> if a college names a building after a former CEO who is convicted of a serious felony and goes to prison, should the building be renamed? discussion at our table. We feel that it's a, a sort of a two-way street when an institution accepts money from somebody. Uh, there's an implicit bargain here that the money that's being given is given by a person of, of good character that the that whose name is going to be on a building and that that name uh, on the university's building is affiliated with that university. Uh, so in the event of a, a felony conviction uh, as students walk by this building in the future and somebody's name is up on the, on the building, it seems to imply that the university uh, is okay with what's happened right, by keeping this name up on the building. Uh, and therefore, uh, open, opens up a whole host of ethical worms of unpleasant implications. Uh, so we feel that the name probably ought to be removed uh, from the building uh, as a result of ethical transgressions that are resulting in people ending up in prison. Thank you. Thank you, Green Hills. Um, I, I sympathize with that answer, but I think it would be incredibly complicated to be renaming all the buildings out there. <laughs> And you also now have, a, you have, when you accepted the money, you did accept it on the faith of the character at the time. And on top of it, what are the ethics of renaming a building and taking double dipping, taking another bit of money? Like, oh, you can have your name on this building if you give me another ten million. And in fact, would we not want to then choose people whose character might be flawed for a building? He could rename that building five times and make a lot of money. And um, I won't, I won't name names of some buildings in our own town, but if there's a situation around it. All right, so all you nonprofits, you don't know how to make more money. Okay. All right, team six, life, death, and pickles. Okay, this is a long one. This question has to do with the recent news about bird flu research. Where scientific journals have been called on to restrict details of the reports for biosecurity reasons. How should we ethically handle dual use research where merely knowing something can be risky and harmful, but the same information can be beneficial for reducing other risks? Do I need to read that again? Yes? This question has to do with the recent news about the bird flu research, where scientific journals have been called on to restrict details of the reports for biosecurity reasons. How should we ethically handle dual use research where merely knowing something can be risky and harmful, but the same information can be beneficial for reducing other risks.
in Denmark who were doing work with the avian uh, flu, the H5N1 virus. They do work in ferrets and they figured out a way to mutate the virus so that it could go airborne from one ferret to another ferret, which it was never able to do before. They submitted their uh, results uh, in two separate papers, one to the journal Science, one to the journal Nature. And while they were under review, a biosecurity advisory panel uh, to uh, the Department of Defense and Homeland Security advised the journal, came up with a recommendation to the journals, not to publish the methods uh, of these papers, in these papers, on the, on the concern that the information could be used nefariously to create dangerous viruses. Um, the, there was a, um, <clears throat> so the question becomes, is this one censorship, which we think is wrong? I'd say, first of all, this is how it was played in the media as a question of censorship, but it's not a question of censorship because the governmental body that made this advice was giving advice. They had no control, they had no authority. They were simply asking the journals uh, to make this restriction. It comes down to a question of freedom. Clearly, there is a freedom to publish this information, but freedom does, it does not mean that you need to do everything you are free to do. So the scientists who are presenting this work and most importantly the journals have an obligation to take a look at this and look at the balance between scientific freedom and the importance of sharing uh, results with methods so that they can be reproduced versus any possible adverse events of published adverse consequences such as security uh, implications. This is a responsibility of the journals and the editorial board has the responsibility to weigh these decisions and make a decision. So the, the journals are in the seat of power, they should make that decision you shouldn't do everything you can do. And that was the end of round two. Congratulations, two rounds down. Um, another brief intro here. Um, we do have commemorative posters. They're very colorful. Um, you might see some folks walking around with big ethical question slam t-shirts. The posters look like that as well. So if you're interested in purchasing one, they are five dollars. So judges, do we have any commentary? I really like the fact that um, there was a backstory to this and kind of helped uh, give it a context. However, uh, part of the uh, question had to do with the information gotten from this uh, research could be beneficial for reducing some other risks. That, that side of it wasn't really brought out that much. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure what positives could come out of it unless it was if in fact someone else <laughs> you know, created this uh, potential that we would, through this research, we'd be able to combat it. So I wish you would have maybe gone along those lines a little bit and talked about that. All right, so we're gonna come back to team one. I'm gonna let the judges finish their tally for the end of this round. Please remember your servers, Colleen, Brandon, and Dan. They're out and about and around, so if you need anything, let them know.
it's a lemon drop. It's not a lemon drop? Yeah, it's a lemon drop. So you have a glass there with sugar around the top, and it's vodka. Drink it. Start the lemon. Happiness. <laughs> yeah, as Janine says, you're working. All right, are we ready for round three? Okay. Okay, uh, we have a decision point here. It is 9.25, so it's taking us about a half an hour to get through a round. So the question is whether you want to end at round three at 10 p.m. or go to round four. So what's, what's the choice? All in favor? Wait. Okay. Three. Put your hands down, please. Everybody for four. All right, we win. We're staying for four rounds. <laughs> food production and buying in many different areas and in many different sectors. And so having more alternatives is always ethically better because you can choose something that you believe in um, with your money and with your support. It also offers um, economically a, um, a, a better alternative because you support people in your own community, you support people doing things that they believe in, you support people doing, um, being able to make a living um, in their own community and offering goods to their neighbors and their um, local community and local stores. Um, it also um, ethically gives a way to build community and to build the ties between people because if you buy something from a store that comes from across the country, not only does it have all sorts of um, ethically ethical impacts in terms of carbon footprint and uh, the costs of shipping across the country, but it also means you don't have the chance to interact with somebody who lives across town and who has grown something or made something with their own um, with their own hands and with their own uh, with the good of the community in mind. So yes, it offers an ethical alternative, and um, it does. <laughs> We're very happy that Think Local first got that question. It feels like it was sort of set up, and that's okay. Um, no, uh, I think nobody in this room would probably disagree with Local being fabulous. Um, there are, though, you know, as was brought up earlier, Local can be at times more expensive. And I know um, one of the good things is the bridge card, which is, you know, the, the, the welfare food house, you know, food card you get. If you take that to Eastern Market, if you take that to Ann Arbor Markets, you get double your money for that. Um, and that is a great thing that we've done. To, but then you also see in Eastern Market how difficult it is for people to actually know how to prepare that food, who need that food. So there are some ethical issues because there is a bit of a class thing to locavore eating, which you know a lot of people in Detroit are working really hard to, to change. Um, 
Yeah, but because it is the best alternative. But well spoken. You just didn't bring up that one. I, I thought it was well articulated argument. Um, yeah. My questions would be um, in terms of, it would be things of scale and and what the <coughs> local community farmers and whether they're dairy, produce, or whatever, meat, mm -hmm. uh, what they could produce for that locality. Is it enough? Uh, is it something that we can expand to to, uh, uh, to a larger audience, or is it very limited uh, by definition? Um, so there are those things as well in terms of just how much food. I mean, if you're going to feed New York City, you're not going to grow food anywhere near New York City, probably, unless everybody <laughs> has an open garden rooftop but uh, so I, I kind of wish you would talk maybe about that but the, are there limitations to a little more with uh, more movement uh, as far as just the feasibility of, of offering that to everyone. All right thank you judges team two next generation plan for this what should we owe our returning veterans to be able to access the programs that do exist for them because there are a great deal of programs that exist for them um, even now uh, but a lot of the times accessibility is the issue so we feel that that is probably the most important thing that we can give a veteran is that support and, in, and information and education for uh, the programs that are available to them but there also is the question of why and the justification for doing that and of course that is a relatively straightforward, easy answer uh, because they have sacrificed so much for all of us that we're home and not fighting on the front lines and putting their lives literally at risk. So it really is, we feel, pretty straightforward, uh, but it is like a two-part, it's a two-part uh, consideration in terms of the ethics behind it. Um, so that's our answer. And we have a tradition of always just greasing the skids with the uh, the drinks for the judges, so you know, we wanted to Cheers. make sure you got that. I think that uh, most people in this room would agree that uh, returning veterans deserve better treatment than the Vietnam veterans, certainly. I think we learned a big lesson there, but I would have liked to have you focus more on who the we was. Uh, is this government? Is it a, a, a community that the vet returns to? Is it every one of us in that community? Is it just the Veterans Administration down the street? Uh, is it the businesses, the local businesses? Uh, I think first people over there, do they hire a returning vet? Uh, uh, no pressure, just you know, <laughs> comment. Uh, so I would like to see, you had more time, and, and so don't be afraid to expand and develop it and get very specific about how this support would manifest itself and who's the we, who should uh, be helping out. All right, team three. We have the DRCs. What are the ethical questions involved when a company is the only supplier of a high-risk, life-saving product? Good evening. 
keep you honest. That's the, the, uh, there seem to be three issues for us that we would uh, focus on. Pricing, supply, and disclosure. <clears throat> In the pricing issue, if you're the sole supplier for a life-saving product, how do you price the product in an ethical way so that you're not gouging but recovering your fair return, considering investment in products that you may have been high risk in the past that you've lost on, but in this case, you have a success. With the pricing, though, comes a responsibility to ask the question, what about the indigent? And how do you price to the indigent population or the population um, that can't pay for it? What provisions can you make for that? Among those provisions certainly would be to donate the product, but if you donate that, you're incurring costs that you presumably you're going to recover from some other customers um, and should it be fair then to have customers pay essentially twice for the life-saving product? Or do you look perhaps to the government? Do we as taxpayers wish to assume that responsibility? With respect to supply, what happens if the company goes out of business? Is the company ever allowed to go out of business? What happens to the intellectual property that um, gave you this position? Can it be transferred to some other entity? to um, uh, take advantage of, particularly if there are people whose lives, as stated in the question, depend on it. Finally, in the disclosure area, what we don't know from the question is, how does it improve, uh, how does it save the life? What is the quality of life that, is, that results from the life having been saved? So there is an obligation for full disclosure. It may be possible that the quality of life that ensues from this product is not the quality that one would wish to take advantage of. It's important to remember, the life you pay to save may be your own. <laughs> Thank you, dear All great points, I think. Uh, also, one, another thing to consider would be um, what the what the type of disease or, or that you're trying to treat. In other words, is it pretty widespread or is this a very small population? Right. Uh, I like the fact that you, you got right out in front of your argument. You listed the three uh, sort of variables or concerns, pricing, supply, and disclosure. I, I would have liked to see, I know you were running out of time, I would like to see you talk a little bit more about the disclosure uh, I wasn't sure exactly what you were getting at there. I know you mentioned that uh, the company should disclose exactly what the product does. I, I would think the FDA would make them do that anyway. So I, I wasn't sure. I, I was thinking when you mentioned disclosure, I was thinking maybe you were going to go a different line of, uh, of attack on that one. So I didn't quite quite get that one. Uh, but I thought the argument itself was very clear, <coughs> very organized, um, and you looked at many of the issues that uh, surround this one. Thank you, judges. And we are on team four. Okay, our process. Is it right to base the punishment of adolescents for crimes on the findings of neuroscience, such as the use of brain scans demonstrating their brains are less mature? Do we have a responsibility to use the findings of neuroscience to reform punishments? Anybody let me read that again? I'm going to read that one more time. Is it right to base the punishment of adolescents for crimes on the findings of neuroscience, such as the use of brain scans demonstrating their brains are less mature? Do we have a responsibility to use the findings of neuroscience to reform punishments? Good luck. develop at a different rate than adults. And I believe we have research in that article, but research from my days in uh, social work um, that indicates that adolescence in our Western culture is more prolonged than in other cultures. Because of that, I think we have a duty to use neuroscience to enhance punishments for adolescents. I believe some of the research indicates that adolescents are less 
capable of understanding the full ramifications of their decisions made during adolescence. But they are also more capable of benefiting from, let's say, rehabilitation rather than punishment. Yes, I don't think we can ignore that. It's interesting in our society that we have set these ages for adolescents. 16, we can drive. 18, we can go into the military. 21, we can drink. I believe for some purposes, we need to revisit some of those things based on neuroscience. When is a, when is a child mature enough to go to war? When is a child mature enough to drive a car? When is a child mature enough to vote? All of those, I think, can be enhanced as well as the decision uh, with punishment by the use of neuroscience. And I think we do our population and our culture a disservice if we don't use the sciences that do exist to enhance decision making. And we do a disservice to a population that could benefit from rehabilitation probably more than at any other time when they are adolescents. And how are you going to say? Thank you, Barbara. We were, so we were discussing this a bit going into this. Obviously, we have a Gabby Giffords case recently where mentally um, the, the, the shooter in that case has been found incompetent. He's not an adolescent, but he's just kind of beyond that, I think. Um, we were discussing that there is some leniency already um, on the part of adolescents by, by age, but I think the arguments made were very good, very clear. And that it is true, you want to look at all science that you have. We were wondering, and maybe you could have brought this up, when we say, do we have a responsibility to use the findings, who, who, who would be that governing board? You know, Obviously, that would turn out to be probably expert witnesses in cases. And so that is the question, who would be evaluating that information? Um, but if we all believe science is pretty factual, then, then yes. All right, so we're going to go to team five, which is Green Hills. <laughs> Are zoos unethical? <laughs> yeah, really, that's the question. Are zoos and I feel that the question is actually not so much about zoos, but about a different kind of question, which has to do with species and what Peter Singer might call speciesism. Does one species have the right to benignly, paternalistically decide what's best for another species? And so you could look at zoos as being a kind of benign captivity, if you want to, or you can look at it as an opportunity to pragmatically educate so that um, you can create other opportunities, both for people to learn, but also for conservation and preservation. So there are a series of ethical issues, but they tend to split into two uh, different ideas, we think. One is focusing on the ethical, the ethical operation of any zoo, which is important, which is to try and create the most benign possible captivity, but it's still benign captivity. And what are the responsibilities? Do we have that right? that right is determined in large part by the good that can be achieved through conservation. Because if you go to the other extreme and you say, absolutely not, then what you do is you say, we have no opportunity ever to do anything to affect what we call nature or any species that's not under our aegis. So we really have to decide if we are going to, to participate in what is called, and I don't mean to be sexist, but it's called animal husbandry, um, uh, the, the, the benign care uh, of animals and we would argue that in fact it serves the greater good because otherwise our hands are tied by refusing ever to play the role of um, 
the nurturer or the the the, 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 the sort of animal husband of the world. Thank you. So when we're done with uh, round three, if we can have each table select one person to take their audience participation scorecards back to Mary. You guys without a table, talk amongst yourselves. That's Mary over there. Okay. So judge commentary. I thought it was pretty good. I, I liked uh, all the points made. I I don't have pretty criticism. I give you a point just for mentioning the singer. So, um, one thing I, I, I don't think that was looked at, you talked about the, uh, you know, the conservation, the preservation of species and whatnot, and then you mentioned this benign captivity, but I would think there's even a, a, a yet a, a deeper negative that one could talk about too. Um, you know, some of the forcible and, and you know, forcible ways in which animals are captured, perhaps, we could have looked at some of those kinds of really, truly negative and, and uh, unethical kind of practices. So the benign captivity, to me, was just sort of, an, you know, it's no harm is coming, no good is coming necessarily, they're just being held captive. So I would have liked to have seen something a little stronger in the negative. Okay, thank you, judges. And our last question of this round uh, for team six. What is an act in business that you regard as one that goes above and beyond your obligations as a business? What is an act in business that you regard as one that goes above and beyond your obligations as a business? as one that goes above and beyond your obligations as a business. You know, I'm not in business, but I, my understanding of business is that part of the, probably the significant goal is the maximization of profits. And yet, I think when we look at people that we strongly admire because of their virtue, um, we do so because they have the ability or have a history of subverting their own self-interest for the benefit of another. So I would think that any business that would engage in that particular type of activity in a very um, uh, unadvertised and unpromotional way would probably be a business that um, probably should be held above the rest. And I guess uh, an example of that would be, you know, occasionally you see donation boards and sometimes there is a donation which is given of a significant amount of money and it's given by someone named Anonymous. And I think that where no benefit can ever fall back on the individual who participated in that act, that that would be truly a benevolent, a benevolent act. I think something that has happened here locally of a local delicatessen providing free coffee to the homeless is probably in many circumstances a similar type of act. It's a group of individuals that cannot, uh, that will receive a benefit from that act, but by the same token, cannot marginally improve the profits of that organization. Life Death did a great job. I think it is going beyond being self-serving and looking to the betterment of the community. And um, and you obviously mentioned some companies we know. It would be nice if Groupon, a bunch of Michigan guys, could maybe open a little office in Detroit instead of Chicago. But it is what people do. And you have to also look at the ethics of kind of getting your company off the ground. But we know healthcare, you know, is, is a key thing, and these are basic rights that we hope co companies give, but to go beyond, as Zingerman says, with giving out free coffee, for instance, is a great example. All right.
perfect. So, that was the end of round three. Can we have a big round of applause for all of our teams? short break and we are going to tally um, our audience participation and also our judges scores. We're going to see who gets to take home the philosopher's hat and also $600. And don't forget the smoothie. I know. <laughs> So it was only 10 points difference uh, within the first two, and then the rest were about a hundred point different after that. Uh, the the runner-up, you don't win anything, but you are amazing. Uh, with 276 is the DRC. Somebody will buy you brunch if you want to go. You should just ask. Uh, and then the winners from from the audience at 266 was Ann Arbor Hospice. Thank you. 